Right. Good morning, everyone. Uh, it's good to be here. Let's begin this time with a word of prayer, and then we'll get into our sessions this morning. Let's pray. Father, we want to thank you for this beautiful day that you have blessed us with, God. We thank you. Lord, what a privilege it is to come into your presence and just ponder on your word, meditate on your word, O God. And even as we learn about church planting, O God, we thank you for this wonderful opportunity, Lord, that each one of us can be partakers, Lord, of, of Lord, just uh, building your kingdom, being part of a local church, raising up local churches, O God. And even as we learn, O oh God, I pray that you give us the wisdom, you give us insight, O oh God. Bring revelation into our hearts, into our spirit, O oh God, that, that, Lord, you will stir us up, Lord. Even as we study and learn from this course, O oh God, stir our hearts to do, Lord, whatever you have in store for us, O oh God. We commit each and every one of us into your hands, Lord. We thank you. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen. Okay. So last class, we looked at chapter six, uh, the spiritual dynamics of urban centers. And um, we looked at four churches in the book of Revelations. And, uh, you know, in those churches, the Lord Jesus is talking about, uh, you know, things that are happening within the church. Uh, so for the church in Smyrna, he says there's a, there's a group that belong to Satan. Pergamos, he says, Satan throne is in that place then Thyatira he says there's a false prophet Jezebel who's working her works in the church and also the church in Philadelphia which says there's a presence of a group that belongs to Satan yet the point of learning these four these churches in the book of Revelation is for us to understand that even as we go about you know uh, planting a church and or or serving in a church, we must understand that uh, there will be infiltrations by the enemy, right? The enemy will try to come against the church. Uh, this is this will happen. It will continue to happen years later. It will it will happen, right? But you and I as believers need to understand what are some of the spiritual dynamics. So we looked at how. We, what we can do is we can, uh, you know, if you've, if you've focused on a certain area, what are the things that are happening in that area, right? What are the spiritual dynamics? What, how are people plugged in? How are things happening spiritually in that place? What are the kinds of worship that happen in that area? So these are, this is a bit of homework that we will have to do. Yet, even yesterday, last week, as we were learning this, we focused on one important thing. That is what? Our mind and our attention is not on what the enemy is doing, but our mind and our focus is on what the Lord Jesus said. What did the Lord Jesus say? I will build my church. The gates of hell shall not prevail against it. And there are plenty of verses where, where this declares the power of God. So even as the enemy is working, our focus is... Now, for example, you choose a place and say, I'm going to start a church. And I don't go and do a survey and say, oh, man, this place is too difficult. I'm not going to do this. Or there's too much of a battle here. I'm not going to do this. Listen, if God has called you, God will provide the means for you. God will give you the grace to do what you have to do. Right? So don't fear the enemy. Don't fear what he's doing. You look at God because this is the work that, you're doing when it comes to church planting or church ministry is not the work of man. It's a work of God. So God knows how to overthrow the works of the enemy. Right? So that's what we did last class. Let's get into chapter seven. Chapter seven is a short, chap short, short uh, uh, chapter, but uh, we're just going to look at uh, urban church planting that happened in the book of Acts. Right in the book of Acts, we see that urban church planting and missions in the book of Acts. Now, uh, remember when we, uh, we, I think it was one of the topics, was it the local church where we did uh, uh, the case study on the church of, in Jerusalem? So let's read Acts chapter 1 and verse 8. Now, remember the background, what is happening? Acts chapter 1, John chapter 20. Jesus has already resurrected. He has met with the disciples. 
and after meeting with them in flesh he tells them he he blows on them the holy spirit and says receive the holy spirit now he says that but then in acts 1 8 he says go and wait in acts chapter 1 he says go and wait for the promise which i am going to send to you right and acts chapter 1 and verse 8 we all know what happened let's read that anyone can read acts chapter 1 and verse 8 okay so i just request some of us to be ready with these uh, verses so that we can just go on to them quickly Acts I, chapter go ahead Acts chapter 1 verse 8 but you shall receive power when the holy spirit has come upon you and you shall be witnesses to me in jerusalem and in all judah and samaria and to the end of the earth yeah so we know this commission now jesus is saying go and wait and when as you wait you will receive power to be a witness meaning what wherever you go you'll be a witness and where will you be a witness uh, in jerusalem in judea samaria and in the ends of the earth so this is a commission that god has given us the lord jesus is saying i will give you the power to be a witness and one of the areas that i always like to focus on when it comes to ministry is the work of the holy spirit right now it's interesting that jesus himself knew that these disciples the 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 11 disciples and the others who were waiting in the upper room jesus knew that without the holy spirit they cannot do the ministry so he says go and wait i will pour out my spirit then you will receive power to be a witness now what is it that we can learn very important lesson even though when it comes to church planting it is a practical there are a lot of practical steps next chapter we're talking about practical aspects on getting started in planting a local church but um, the calling of god upon your life god calls us right he puts a call so for example if he's calling you as a pastor or as a ministry leader the call of god is there but there is some responsibility that is upon us what does Jesus say? You will receive power to do what? To be a witness. Right? Now, the calling is there. Now, I cannot depend on my calling. No, I cannot say, hey, I'm a pastor, so God will do everything else. Or I'm an evangelist, God will do everything else. The calling is there. Paul writes and he says, our gifts and our callings are irrevocable. That means God won't take it away. It's given to us. But there is a responsibility that you and I must fulfill. We have to go back, ask God for his anointing, ask God for the power of the Holy Spirit to be demonstrated in the work of ministry that we are doing. So, so I, I believe that if we try to do ministry on our own strength, we will fail. Right? Because the work of the ministry is a supernatural work. It's a spiritual work. Yes, we use our mind, right? So, for example, somebody may come to you and say, you know, you may be a pastor of a church. Somebody may come to you and say, you know, I, I, I've gone, I'm going through this problem in, uh, in my life. Now, of course, we use the wisdom. We use our knowledge. We try to help them to overcome or give them solutions or uh, give them good counsel. Yet, we need to depend on the spirit of wisdom from the Holy Spirit to bring revelation into their hearts. So you see the balance here? Right, you're with me, everyone? Right, you see the balance? There's the natural aspect, there is the spiritual aspect. Now the problem is, sometimes we put 80% of our efforts on the natural aspect and put 20% effort on spiritual things. Now it's interesting, Jesus here, he tells them, go and wait he's done the work he's defeated death he's met with the disciples now jesus didn't go and say didn't say okay everyone meet me now i will divide you into teams right like what he did in his earthly ministry remember he said he 
he made teams and he said, go out and preach. He didn't do that. He said, go and wait. The Holy Spirit will come upon you. And when he comes upon you, you will know what to do after that. Right. So we see that in the church in uh, Jerusalem, Acts chapter 2. Uh, when we look at this, they are praying. The Holy Spirit falls on them mightily on the day of Pentecost. Uh, we all know the story, right? But look at what uh, Peter's address. Uh, Peter addresses. He bigs, gives a long discourse, a long sermon, as to you know, pointing to what is happening there, right? So that goes on from Acts chapter two, fourteen onwards, all the way up to verse forty-one. Right, so he's he's explaining what is happening here. Now, out of all of this, uh, if you if you read that whole passage there, you know, men of Israel, verse twenty-two, Jesus of Nazareth was a man accredited by God to you by miracles, wonders, and signs which God him God did among you from him, as you yourselves know. He goes on to you know bring out the whole thing, right? Uh, what Jesus did, he quotes from. Uh, uh, from what from the Psalms and um, and then he says, you know, your, your patriarchs David and Moses spoke of this prophet, and he brings all of it, points it to Jesus, says, you crucified him, but now he's resurrected. Now there is an opportunity for you to repent and be baptized. What does he do? He preaches a simple gospel. Three thousand people come into the church. The church is established. Acts chapter two, three thousand people. Now, how did it happen? Through the baptism of the Holy Spirit. But was it necessary to give this entire sermon? Peter's entire passage, what, he, what we see uh, from Acts 14 onwards, was that necessary? Yes or no? Was it necessary? It, was it necessary or no? Yes, it was. Imagine they're all, you know, uh, speaking in tongues and, you know, it's new for them. For us, speaking in tongues, okay, we understand. But they're all like, what is happening here? Now, what if there's nobody to explain it there? What if, uh, you know, everyone were just continuing to pray three, four hours, five hours? They would have, okay, something's happening here. They would have just walked on by. God did the supernatural. Peter stood up, did the natural. said, this is what it is. This was Joel, what Joel spoke of, and he's pointing everything. People were cut to the heart. They began to believe. They understood what Peter was saying, and the church was planted. So we see here that it was a simple work of the Holy Spirit tied up with the wisdom of man. Now think of this. This is the same Peter who was afraid was fearful and this man is what is peter he's just a simple fisherman there's nothing great about him he's not a pharisee he's not a rabbi he's not a teacher he's not a great a, a, a scribe in the uh, in the temple he's a fisherman but he's standing there and pointing out this message so we see that through the preaching of the word and supernatural work of god the church was planted. Now, if you move on, the persecution happened in Acts chapter 8. The believers were spread out. Sorry, in Acts chapter 2. Uh, but Acts chapter 3, 4, 5, 6, all of these places, the church began to grow. Churches were planted all across, right? All across uh, uh, Judea, Samaria, um, uh, Antioch. So churches were being planted. How were they planted? By regular believers, simple believers who believe the gospel, went out, used the same formula or used the same way that the early church was planted. They went, preached the gospel, people believed, the church was planted. Right? Now, if you go all the way from there to Acts chapter 8, and in Acts chapter 8, you see uh, the church being persecuted. And uh, uh, if you see there, the, the church, the ministry goes, Philip, the Ethiop Philip and the Ethiopian, the work of the gospel enters Africa through the preaching of the gospel. Again, a powerful act of ministry here. 
right? Acts chapter 8, look at verse 26 onwards. Now an angel of the Lord said to Philip, go south to the road, the desert road that goes down from Jerusalem to Gaza. So he started out and on his way, he met an Ethiopian eunuch and an important official in charge of all the treasury of Candace, queen of the Ethiopians. This man had gone to Jerusalem to worship and on his way home was sitting in the chariot and reading from the book of Isaiah, the prophet. The spirit told Philip, go to the chariot and stay near it. Then Philip ran to the chariot and heard the man reading Isaiah, the prophet. Do you understand what you're reading? Philip asked. How can I, he said, unless someone explains it to me. So he invited Philip to come up and sit. Now, look at what's happening here. Again, we see a beautiful combination of the work of the Holy Spirit and the work of God, work of man. This eunuch is going. He's finished worship in Jerusalem and going. The Holy Spirit comes, or the angel of the Lord says, the Spirit takes Philip to the chariot. Now, what is Philip doing there near the chariot? He's not saying, okay, now what to do, Lord? He knew that God has already taken him the first step. So he's there. He's, he's listening to this Ethiopian reading from the book of Isaiah. He says, so simple question again, you know. Very simple question. Do you understand what you're reading? And then the whole thing goes on. The eunuch is, uh, you know, Philip explains the whole thing. The eunuch believes, is baptized, gets into Africa. And we know that, you know, missions went into Africa through this, right? Of course, through other many other areas, but we know that it would have entered Africa through this person. Then we see, in Acts chapter 13, again, the great conversion of the Apostle Paul and Acts 13 onwards all the way through Acts 26, we see Paul going about planting churches. First place, he goes into Galatia. He goes, he plants churches in Galatia. Then in his first missionary journey, wherever he went, he preached the gospel, signs, wonders and miracles, churches were planted. Right. So what is it that Paul did? He was able to understand the area. He was able to understand the geographical location. He was able to understand the mindset, the culture of the people. Right. Uh, in lifestyle evangelism, evangelism, remember, we spoke of Acts chapter 17, right? How Paul goes into um, Athens and he was able to dialogue with those the, the people of Athens, and he there was there was no miracles there, right? There was no rising from the dead, people healed there, nothing. It was all the wisdom of God, right? So when you look at Paul's ministry, again, from Acts 13 onwards all the way to 26, his first missionary journey, planting many, many churches, right, all in the area of Galatia, then he goes on to his second missionary journey, a powerful missionary journey, right? Same formula, same way. Go in, go into the synagogues, preach the gospel, uh, understand the people, understand where they are. You know, when he went to Corinth, he knew what's the mindset there. When he went to uh, Athens, he knew what the mindset was there. Ephesus, Philippi, Thessalonica, um, uh, wherever he went, right? Uh, he was able to understand, to reason, and very effectively plant churches, right? And so when we look at the book of Acts, we see that church planting happened. And I, I would say more than half of it happened through the great apostle Paul. And we also saw missions. The church in Antioch released apostles and prophets within two or three years of its birth. Right. What does God want for us from this, from this entire uh, chapter that we are learning? What do you think the Lord wants us to understand? I just put down a few things. Number one, understand that God is in control of everything. God is in control over everything. He knows what he's doing, right? Number two. Jesus promised that he will build his church. 
He promised he'll do it. Thirdly, he has promised us the Holy Spirit. He has given us the Holy Spirit. It's not like he's saying, go and do it. No, he's saying, I am with you. I will give you the strength. I will give you the power. I'll give you whatever you ask of in my name. I'll give it to you. Fourthly, God gives us the grace and the wisdom to walk in the call of God on our lives. He gives us the grace. He gives us the wisdom. Right? Fifth, just the last one. Trust God and have faith in Him. Sometimes, you know, I think those those are the just five points that I just thought of. But there are many more things that we can learn from this. Sometimes we can get so focused, so dialed in into what the enemy is doing. Look at the Apostle Paul when he went into Corinth. You know, he's living in a time in Corinth and in Ephesus where there is so much of idolatry, sexual immorality, there is hatred, there is sin prevalent everywhere. Did Paul go into Corinth and say, oh, this is a dangerous place. You see this big temple here, you see prostitutes, you see idol worship, you see sexual immorality. I don't think we can start a church here. Did it deter Paul? It didn't affect him because he knew what he was carrying and he knew that the power of God is able to change. You know, the church is the church must be able to impact the world and not the other way around. So what is happening around did not affect him at all. Because he knew if God wanted, he will do it. Look at Ephesus. Same thing, a harbor, so much of idolatry, uh, sin, and uh, you know uh, the goddess of lust. A, a very, very sinful place. It didn't deter him. He stayed there for two and a half years. He planted a church. He raised up a strong local church. When he's writing to Timothy, he says he's already you know in that church. He's got elders, deacons, overseers, everyone. And he's sending Timothy, go and pastor the church. Meaning what? An established, strong church was already running in Ephesus. What is surrounding Ephesus? Sin and sexual immorality and all kinds of works of the enemy. Yet, God broke through. So very important lesson for us. If God, you know, especially in the nation of India, things may not be looking right when it comes to missions, church planting. We may feel, what is the enemy doing? We can't go out. We can't be free like what it was maybe 10 years back. You know, there was some kind of freedom. Now things are getting worse. Now with all the Western culture coming into our nation, um, it, it's not wrong. Uh, there are good things, but there are also bad things coming in, right? And so the enemy is bringing all kinds of things within the church, outside of the church. Uh, the presence of the enemy is there everywhere. Yet, just like Apostle Paul, he went, he planted churches, he saw the work of God. You and I can do it with the power of the Holy Spirit. But if we try it on our own, if we try it on our own, we will fail. Number one responsibility I think the Apostle Paul had was, what did he say? I preach Christ crucified. He says, it's not about me. It's not about my intellect. It's not about what I know. It's not about the churches that I had planted. It's not about my strength, my physical strength. No, I preach Christ crucified. That's what I've been sent for. I've not even been sent to baptize. To the Corinthians, he says, not sent to be baptized as well. I preach Christ crucified, not with words of wisdom, lest the power of the cross be emptied of itself. And this is something that we can hold on to. In all that is happening around us, hold on to the cross. Trust God to move. And He will. He will. Even till the end of time, even till, you know, until the rapture happens, God will work. Churches will be planted. 
churches missions will continue there's no government there's no work of the enemy that can stop this what is the enemy going to do the previous chapter we learned right he's going to infiltrate he's going to try and loosen our gr the grip within a local church yet god is with us god is watching and so it's very important for us to, as believers to to set aside these times if god is calling you to be in the mission field oh that's a lot you know mission work is one of the most difficult works that i've been i had been part of a couple of mission works many many years back as a young boy uh, just as i became a believer and it is completely opposite to looking after the church it's very difficult you need the grace of god right yet i want to encourage each one of you if god is calling you you go back to god go back spend time in his word spend time in his presence draw from him what does jesus say he says i am the vine you are the branches with if without me you can do nothing but if we are connected to him he will begin to work in us so that is our responsibility right even as we plan uh, now we'll get into the practical aspects but uh, if you look at the book of acts we see that they spend many hours praying and reading the word of god that was their primary then came the miracles then came the work of the ministry first it was prayer and submitting to god so i want to encourage all of us right uh, it may be you may be you know thinking of planting a church or you may be also thinking of you know serving in the church that you're currently in go back to god ask god even if you're you know serving in a church ask god for wisdom ask god for grace ask god for strength to open you know to help you to start new ministries plan new ministries you need the wisdom of god for that right so uh so let's keep this in the background right even as we get into practical aspects this is our main focus yeah sometimes sometimes you know i i think to myself let me just take a break in the sense let me rest well just wake up, you know, enjoy, not enjoy, but just wake up, feel fresh, go do your work, you know, just relax. Let what has to happen, happen. How many of you have felt that? Sometimes I've felt that. Right? Just wake up, 7 o'clock, 7 a.m., you know, get ready, send the kids to school, come do your teaching. In, the, in between, just read a couple of verses, do a few small prayers. Go back home, just relax, rest, sleep. One day is over. Do the same thing the next day, Monday to Friday. Saturday, just relax, go play a few games, come back. Uh, Sunday, just maybe a couple of hours before, just go through the sermon, preach something. Sometimes you feel that. But, you know, when you if you try to do that, you will never be satisfied. I tried it. I just could not. I could not, right? And and I think it's it's good to have that burden, right? You need to be able to, you know, one of the things that should excite you is to get into the presence of God. You know, all of you know that I went to Sydney and I, and I lost my brother, but it was a very hard time, a right? very hard time. But but one of the things I, uh, you know, a lot of questions, a lot of thoughts. Oh, God, why did why did this happen? It's there, right? Just because I'm, uh, you know, serving in the as a, as a pastor doesn't mean I don't have. I did have questions, but the more the questions, the more I went back to God and I said, God, I trust you. I trust your works. You know, we sing a lot of songs. It for me, it came back to really putting it into practice. That Lord, you are sovereign over this situation. And if it was not for those times in God's presence and just being there, we, we can't go through all of these things on our own strength. We need God. When it comes to ministry also, we need Him. 
We cannot be fruitful without that. That's the grace that God gives us. We have to go back. Go back to Him. Uh, especially if God is calling you for that kind of level of leadership and that mantle, if you have to carry, there's a lot to be done. Right? So be encouraged. Don't be discouraged with what is happening around. Don't read only the news. You know, I know we're reading, studying about end times and Bible prophecy. It's an encouraging thing to study about it. It's not to bring fear, but it's to, uh, it's a hope that we have that we will be with the Lord and we don't have to go through all of this. Right? Okay. Now we'll get into the next section. Any questions? Any thoughts? All right. So we looked at uh, what is the church in God's eyes. We looked at the natural dynamics. We looked at spiritual dynamics. And then we also looked at uh, a combination of natural and spiritual dynamics uh, in the book of Acts and how they planted churches. Now, practical aspects. How do we engage in establishing a local church or uh, establishing urban missions in a city? Right? Now, again, Remember, you may say, you, some of you may think, hey, I'm in a town or I, I'm in a village. We are talking about a city. Remember, we started this course by saying villages and have become towns. Now, towns have become cities. Things are changing. So we need to change our mind. We need to change our thinking. Okay, five years down the line, a town may not be a town. It'll be a city, right? Uh, if I tell you the truth, well, in 2012, right? No, 20, 2010, uh, yeah, around 2010. You know, I used to come down this road, uh, this main road, and I used to come down. It used to be empty. Now there's no empty place. It used to be really empty. There's nothing. Very strange how things have so drastically changed. And so in Chapter 8, we're going to look at personal preparation of a church planter, right? Now, again, uh, don't, don't feel, okay, I'm not going to plant my own church, so don't switch off. There's a lot of things that we can learn and you can apply, even if you're working in a ministry or you, or you choose to do something else apart from ministry, that's fine. But you can keep this as, as a core in your heart to know that, okay, this is something that God may lead you into many years down the line okay okay number one the church planting core team now when you talk about a core team understand this god may use a person individually to plant a church right he may say he may just pick one person and say you plant the church now if he's put it in a person's heart say okay I want to plant a church. Now, it's very important to form a team. The Lord Jesus did it. What did he do? He, when he started his ministry, he, he chose 12 people. He said, you be with me. Did he need a team? Think of it, yes and no. Right? Because he was also a man. He needed people around him. right? But he was also God. Even if it was not there, he can do everything on his own. Right? But... The point is, he had a team. The Apostle Paul, when he started off, he, he and Barnabas, they got John Mark together. Three of them went together as a team. right? Now, when it comes to a church planting team, here are a few practical things that you must do. Number one, don't... Now, it may not be... Some of the points may not be here. I'm going to just add a few points. right? Have a healthy, good, healthy relationship with each other. Now, you need to find a person whom you trust. You need to find a person who you support and a person who, who has no personal agenda, right? Not somebody who, has, who wants to start a competition with you, right? So, for example, I, I, okay, let's, let me just take me as an example, right? So, if I want to start a church, right? Now, I'm going to think, okay, firstly, I've done all my background checks. Okay, I plan to start a church in the city of Mumbai, and in Mumbai, you know, 
there's a town, uh, one part of Mumbai. This is the place I'm going to start a church. Now I have this in my mind, in my heart. So what must I do? I need to try and build a core team. Now don't be in a hurry and choose whoever is there. You know, you're, you're traveling in the train or in the plane. Hey, are you a Christian? Yeah, I'm also Christian. Why don't you come? We both will go start a church. Don't do that. Right? Learn to choose the right people. Don't be in a hurry. When we are in a hurry, we end up making the most number of mistakes. Be patient. God will bring the right people. Right? So, if, you, 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 if you're building a core team, you keep in mind, okay, I'll have three people. Example, right? There's no number. You can have two people, you can have three, you can have even 10 people in your core team, right? But the point is, these are people who you must trust. These are people who must be, you must support and they must also be willing to support you. Make sure that these people don't have any personal agenda. Right? Very important. Because this is the foundation of the local church right, that you're going to plant. Right? Have a good, healthy relationship. Now, for example, you have three people. You have chosen three people. First thing you do is you share the vision with them. So you got two, three people, you tell them, hey, so the reason we are getting together now is we want to start a church. And this church we'll start. Uh, we want to make sure that we'll be able to raise up good leaders, right? It's going to be an English church or Hindi church, whatever. You explain everything to them. Don't keep them thinking, oh, what is this? What are we actually doing? No, why are we a team? No, no, no. Don't open a WhatsApp group and then keep it there. No. Right? You got to be able to communicate. As a leader, the uh, the ability to communicate is very important. Right? So, for example, okay, I'm going to take this, right? So I've got three boys here. So Shira, Nikhil, and Francis. So we all three are here. I'm going to sit them down and I'll say, okay, so this is what we're going to do. You three boys. We will plant a church. The church will be an English church. We will start off by doing it in my house. This is the vision of the church. right? This is what we want to achieve. Probably three years down the line, we can also think of starting a Bible college. Now think big. Right? Don't say, okay, I'll be 20 people, then when God provides for us, we will go to it. No, you begin to put everything in, in, in on paper. Right? You have the bigger vision even before you started. Right? So, you, so I'm going to tell, okay. So Francis, you are going to be um, you know, just looking after the prayer. Make sure that all of us are praying, spending time in prayer and worship as a team. Nikhil, you will have to uh, probably look around in in and around us, ten, maybe 10 kilometer radius, what are the colleges, what are the schools, or um, what kind of ministry we can do. Right. Uh, Tira, you, what you do is we can also start looking out for a place. Right. What is the value of rent or lease that's happening around here? Right. Uh, now, we don't have even one person in the church. Right. We've not been started. Okay. Then we put down, okay. So since this is the vision, everything, how do we start? Now Chira will say, let's do <clears throat> worship, praise and worship. We'll do some invites and send. Okay, let's do it. Right. So now what is happening? We're working together as a team. Right. Now, now Francis is not saying, hey, how come my uh, my idea didn't get chosen? Right. And Nikhil is not upset because I'm doing all the uh, hard work of running around, and these two boys are playing guitar and standing. It's not like that, right? So it's all, it's, all, it's all a team effort. That is why you need to choose the right person. You get what I'm saying, right? Now, Nikhil should not be jealous of uh, Chira, and Chira should not be jealous of Francis. It shouldn't be that way. Right? So it should be like all of us together. Now, while praying or while worshiping, I may get a word, right? Or I may get Chira may get Chira may get a word, or Francis gets a word, and so we all are in one mind, in unity, and only then we can work together. I'll give you the best example why 
why you can't work with disunity, with people who are not in one mind. Paul and Barnabas, they went on their first missionary journey. For more than two years, they were together. Think of this. Barnabas went, brought Saul of Tarsus, came. Right? They went together everywhere. For two years, they ate together, they slept together, they preached together, they prayed together, they worshipped together, they saw the miracles together. Everything they did together. Imagine they're on the ship, they're maybe sitting and talking, you know, hey, what do we do once we go there? But they're just doing life together, two and a half years, constantly together. It's not like a break, constantly. They're starting their second missionary journey. What does Barnabas say? Let's take John Mark. Paul says, no, I'm not taking John Mark. I don't want John Mark. He left us. I'm not coming. If he's coming, I'm not coming. Barnabas is saying, no. I want to take him. Paul is saying, no, I don't want him. What happened? Such a sharp dispute that they went two separate ways. Two and a half years of ministry together went in a just a moment. Why? There was no unity. In one way, it's good that it happened. Because if they had gone together, and again, these whole you know disagreements and all of that had happened, the ministry wouldn't have functioned well. You get what I'm saying, right? So you have to be in one mind. You have to be able to share the vision. So for example, God has given me the vision, right? Or you should plant the church and then slowly start a Bible college, which will help people to grow. And then, and then slowly you can, you know, you plant other churches in the city, very similar to APC, right? you plant churches in different parts of the city. Right. Now, it shouldn't be that, you know, as people are coming into the church, uh, somebody asks Chira, hey, Chira, what is this church about? Yeah, we are a church. So what do you want to do? I don't know. We are just meeting on Sundays. What's happening? The fault is mine. We are not a team. He doesn't know why we are, what we are doing. He, he should be able to say, hey, we have started a church. We believe that this is the vision. One day we will start a Bible college. One day we will start churches all across India. And so we're working together. That is what your core team does. Now, another very important point. As you are in the core team, there will be people who will move on. Right? So as a leader, Francis may say, uh, you know, Paul, it's been two years now. The church is planted. We have about 50 people. But I feel in my heart, I have to go back to my hometown and do something. Now, as a leader, I must be able to let him go. I cannot say, no, you have to stay. You are the core team. He can be the core team, but God has put something else in his heart. So whatever he's learned, he can go and you know use it in where he is doing. The moment I hold on to him, that means I have, uh, you know, I'm holding on, I'm stopping what God wants to do in his life. Right? So even as we build a core team, we build trust, we build relationships, but we must also not control and manipulate them. So all, all of us right, are one. OK, if you're moving on, bless them, release them. right? So these are just a few practical things. And why am I saying this? Because I know of ministries that have gone through this problem. I know of pastors who said, you know what? I started the church with this young boy. Now he left me after five years, went and started another church. I said, what's the problem? How can he leave me? I said, he's not married to you. He can go. Right? He can go. He can start. What is he doing? He's not going and sitting in some, uh, you know, sinful, doing some sinful deeds. He's gone to plant a church. No. He's building God's kingdom. Pray for him. Bless him. Release him. Let him go. No. If he goes, who will do the work in my church? Who will open the church? And uh, 10 years I trained him. So what? For what you trained him? For the ministry, not to be under you. And the sad thing is, you know, I'm sad to say this, I've, and I've heard it, and I've seen it also, where many leaders, especially in up north, I've seen who pastors will raise up these leaders, and they will be doing all the housework, buying vegetables, go pick up the children from school, right? Sunday, uh, go repair the guitar. And it's, it's so sad to see that. That's not what raising up leaders means. 
raising up leaders is for the ministry, right? And so have a good, healthy relationship with people in your core team. Be united theologically and spiritually, meaning one heart and one mind. Even as you are planting the church, you speak, obviously, you'll talk about your what your church is, what is your faith statement. So if you go to ABC, you go to a website, it says about us. In about us, you will see what, what do we believe? What is our belief system? Right? We believe in the Father, Son, Holy Spirit, the Trinity, and uh, we believe in the gifts of the Holy Spirit. We believe that every believer is a minister. Everything is mentioned there. So when you have a core team, establishing a core team, make sure that you are all theologically and spiritually one mind. Now, if Chira says, uh, you know, I don't really believe um, that the Holy Spirit is, is working now. It stopped in the book of Acts. And now I go on Sunday morning and I'm preaching. Believe God for the Holy Spirit to touch your lives. Everyone in the church will say, but your worship leader doesn't believe that. And then Nikhil says, uh, you know, I believe there is no rapture. Now I go end times when I'm preaching about rapture. Be ready, folks. In the twinkling of an eye, we'll be gone. And the church people are saying, but your uh, associate pastor doesn't believe. <laughs> and then Francis says, you know, I don't believe in whatever. And I'm preaching about something else. Or I don't believe in the... Uh, Francis says, I don't like the Old Testament. Old Testament is a different guy. Everyone, every time he's angry. And now I'm doing case study in the book of Isaiah. Say, so, you know, God was bringing judgment upon the people because we were sinful. That your uh, assistant pastor doesn't believe. What's happened? We're all in different minds. So theologically, we must be one. Of course, we may have different ways of communicating, right? Now, for example, in, in Bible College, in our locations, it, not sorry, it's where central, um, we all are preaching the same thing, but the sermon is the same. The points are the same, but the way we put it across will be different. Right? The way all five of us have preached on the Sunday sermon will be different. Right? The style, the way we preach, the examples, all of that will be different. But the, the core essence is that we believe in the end times and Bible prophecy. We believe it. We're all one day. Even in teaching, we all, all have different ways of teaching. But we are true to the word. We are all in one mind. You get, you get that, right? So it's very important to be in one mind. Three, be able to complement each other's gifts and skills. Very important. Now, I may not be able to do anything in graphic designing, right? Uh, or uh, any other thing, administration. So now I've chosen Nickel to do administration in the church. But I may give him some input. See, this is what you, this is what I want to see uh, in the church. Uh, so, Nickel, do what you have to do. So, I must be able to complement what he's doing. And say, okay. Now, Chira may be the uh, graphics designer. So, I don't know anything about graphics, right? So, I may say, Chira, I want this, um, you know, this next sermon series we're doing. I want it to, the, the, the image should really be something that can capture the young people. So I, I have to tell him that, and he gets it done. I compliment, I, we complement each other, right? Now, IT, I, I have some problem with, the, you know, I need something to do be done in the IT. I go to Francis. I said, Francis, this is what it is. Now, I'm not saying all of this is going to happen in the beginning of the church itself. As the church grows, we must learn to complement each other, right? And I think I've shared this before, right? Uh, even for one conference, what do we do? We work six months before. First email goes out, right? Uh, save the date banner, save the date image. The name of the event goes out, then the WhatsApp message, then emailer to register, then register WhatsApp two, then emailer two, then uh, WhatsApp two. It goes on and on for six months, and then we have final reminder, and then we have the event. But in all of it, there are so many teams that are working together. We complement each other, right? Okay, we'll take a break. We'll come back and continue.